Well, good morning. Um, it's been quite a week, as you probably have uh, gathered, if you have paid attention even just a little bit. Um, I'm under very strict instructions to finish by noon today. Um, and I may. Uh, if I don't, I'll... <laughs> But uh, it, was, um, it was difficult to prepare today. I, I don't think in terms of what I talk about and what I do here at Fellowship Bible Chapel um, as part of our ministry, I, I don't think there was a week like this that I've had in terms of sifting through the news and other things that, that impact upon uh, Christians, the church, and Bible prophecy. Each week we do talk about the convergence of events, and if you, if you doubt that those, if you have had any doubts that those events are converging and accelerating very rapidly, the events of the past week, the events of the past two weeks, the events of the past month, should put that notion to rest once and for all. I think we've reached the point where it is indis indisputable that these things are going on. So I've titled this prophecy update, In the Grip. In some weeks, I, as I look through these things, look through the news and that type of thing, of course, I always look at things, try to look at things from a biblical, scriptural perspective. And I was struggling this week um, with what to lead off with because I like to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about. And then a friend of mine posted on Facebook, uh, I won't say her name, she knows who she is if she, if she listens to this anymore, I don't know, I assume she does. Um, she posted a few verses and I think those verses are really appropriate to what I have to talk about today. And that's why I've titled this In the Grip. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul lays out one of his great um, <coughs> expositions, commentaries, uh, instructions on the gospel. And he says this in verse 3. And remember, we live in a fallen world. Does anybody doubt that this week? No, nobody does. No, no Christian does. But if our gospel be hid, it is, to, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. <coughs> we do live in a dark world. And Paul continues in verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give, this is always strange, appear or, I have not coughed all morning long, and I get up here and, so, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And one of my pastor friends, uh, Jack Hibbs, gave a great message on this a few years ago in Chino Hills. You can find it on the internet uh, on this particular scripture. And he used the comparison of uh, the story of Gideon. And they remember they had the clay pots the 300 that, that made the cut, made the many cuts, essentially representing the remnant of faithful remnant of God. They had the clay pots, 
and then they went to the camp of the Midianites and they broke the clay pots and what happened? The light came out. It's a picture of us as Christians because, as Pastor Jack said in that sermon, God will break us. So we're totally dependent on him, and then the light comes out. So when we see these things, as troubling as they are, we need to know that God is also stressing us, testing us, and working us to become lights for his glory. It's a, it's a fantastic passage of Scripture. And in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks, though, where in time past, it says, you know, you were like this, folks. You were as bad as these people. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So today I want to look through some things. I have a fairly long intro to get to my point, and then I have some things to add to that, <laughs> which hopefully won't be as long, because I, I can see her sitting in the back looking at me like, you know we have to leave town. So, and not leave town because of what I'm saying yet. I mean, I mean, and that may very well be the case, but, uh, but I want you to listen to the, the things I have to present to you about a world that is in, really in chaos. And, it, it's, and this isn't just my opinion. I could show you headline after headline blog post after blog post, editorial after editorial, where people are saying the same thing. What is going on? Why is this happening? Because, you know, we had an election eight years ago, which was all based on what? Hope and change. Well, now we hope that it will change <laughs> and maybe change back. But I'm not optimistic. And so here is uh, Christine Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary Fund, saying that the European Union is on the brink of collapse. The, the euro may have to be scrapped. The article on the, in the London the Daily Express said this, the IMF warned of economic chaos in the event of a leave victory and has urged a smooth transition for post-EU Britain. The international organization said the euro area is at a critical juncture. Muddling through is increasingly untenable. Unless collective problems are solved, the euro area is likely to suffer repeated bouts of economic and political instability, leading to crisis, crises of confidence and economic setbacks. And she's one of the optimists. The Economist, which was all in favor of Britain, um, United Kingdom, listen, I'm an American, okay? I go over there, I call the whole thing England. I know there's Scotland up north where there's nice golf courses, and I know there's some nice golf courses over in Ireland, and there's even some green landscape over there. So, but you know, when I call it England or Great Britain or United Kingdom, I'm, I'm talking about that whole area, okay? Uh, excuse my ignorance. And I know there's parts of England, and there's Wales, and so anyway. But The Economist is a very secular-oriented magazine. People say it's part of the world, New World Order. They wanted the United Kingdom to stay within the European Union. They didn't want them to leave. But now, even they're coming out and saying, this is the cover of the New Economist, the Italian job. Europe's next crisis. The Italian banks are on the brink of major, serious collapse. They will soon be followed by, Gre well, Greece has already gone through its own crisis. It has more to come. Spain and Portugal will follow. Uh, it's possible that Ireland has gotten some of their act together. But then also another um, geopolitical analyst that I read says, the European Union is fracturing apart. All of the old European communist countries, Eastern European communist countries, want to leave. 
They don't, they, they don't trust the West. And what you see everywhere you look around the world is you see chaos and division. You see it within societies. You see it within cultures. You see it within countries. Everywhere you look is this division. I'm going to suggest to you what might be a root cause of that and the root cause that I don't think will change until the Lord returns. Look at this. <coughs> this was a uh, person on the European Commission who was in charge of <coughs> the um, migration, the, the immigrant part of the EU Commission's policy. Now, the European Union po population went up last year by 2 million. That's a stunning number in light of some of the demographics I presented to you over time, which shows that the European Union is in the midst of major uh, demographic de decline from native Western Europeans. People aren't getting married. They're not having children. The replacement rate, you know, you, women have to have 2.1 children per woman. I'm not sure what the point one is, but uh, average 2.1, just to keep the population even. Most of the um, population rates in Western Europe are 1.5 down to 1 or below. Russia, for example, for a long time has been between 1.0 and 1.1. What that means is that effectively, among native Russians, Within one generation, there will be half the number of people without immigration. Russia has a major immigration problem with Islamic immigration. I've read, I think this is a fantasy, because I think it will happen much more quickly at the rate things are going, that they will have over 50% 50 50 Muslim population within Russia within by 2050. Think about that, 20, uh, 30 years, Russia will be more majority Muslim. Europe won't be far behind. That has major geopolitical consequences, that, and in terms of Bible prophecy as well. So, but what this policy person about immigration said in a meeting in Europe just yesterday, or the other day, was that the European migration problem is at a point where it will likely continue for two centuries. I'm pretty sure I won't be here at the end of that, you know, although, you know, they're, they've already rebuilt, you know, I have a few joint, four joint replacements, so they're already rebuilding me piece by piece, but, uh, the, very, the likelihood that I'm here to see that is, very, is highly unlikely. Well, well, and for, plus, I don't think it'll go on that long anyway. I just think there's, it's a tipping point in the way the world exists. Listen to this. A Swedish delegate at the meeting of EU interior ministers in Bratislava on Thursday. That's actually a real place. I thought they just made it up on Saturday Night Live. So... Um, those of you who are old enough to know what I'm talking about will chuckle. And uh, those of you who look at people, and the younger people here that are like, what's he talking about? You know, go help, old, you older people, go help them out. On Thursday, said there are currently 60 million refugees and 240 million migrants on the move across the globe. That's 300 million people. That's roughly equivalent to the population of the United States being, for lack of a better term, in transit right now. The population of Brazil. That's huge. <laughs> That's unprecedented in human history. It's incredibly destabilizing. It is particularly if people are moving to places where they don't share the values of the place that they're going. And this is happening. It's happening here. It's happening in Europe and it will have a major effect on the geopolitical map. The solution from this uh, guy, um, I can't remember his name right off the top of my head. 
um, he says, Europe must act in the spirit of joint responsibility and solidarity. So in one respect, Europe is falling apart. In another way, the smaller Europe is kind of marshalling their forces to stay intact. And there's a lot of people that want to leave. Current surveys in France show that 60% of the people there don't trust the EU. And that's France. <laughs> you can imagine what it is in some of these other countries. Foreign policy, and before people write in, I know the foreign policy you know, is put out uh, by the, uh, I think this one's published by the Council on Foreign Relations. I know who they are. Okay, I just, you need to filter everything that you hear from these people. <coughs> I, mean, I, I know where they're, <coughs> they're coming from. And I only say this to make a point to see how it lines up with Bible prophecy. Because this article goes through, it's titled, The World's Rising Power Powers Have Fallen. There will be no block of emerging economies rising up to challenge the Western order, but what comes next may be more chaotic and dangerous. Now, that's a secular source. That's why I cite it. And I think uh, the uh, Suzanne uh, Nossel, who wrote this, is correct in her analysis. It will be chaotic. It will be dangerous. Um, she says this in her, in her post. As an analysts and scholars composed their first drafts of the history of the Obama administration's foreign policy, a chapter will surely be addressed. It's going to be more than one chapter, I can tell you that. What were once dubbed rising, rising powers, a group that included Brazil, India, China, South Africa, and others. And they were called the BRICS. Remember the BRIC countries? And they were going to change. They're going to be ascendant. They're going to reshape global economics. And what's happened? It's, it's, it hasn't worked out that way. Academics and analysts anticipated that the rise of news power, new powers could only herald an American decline. In 2010, University of Wisconsin-Madison professor Alfred McCoy predicted imperial collapse and painful daily, that's 2010, painful daily reminders of what such a loss of power means for Americans in every walk of life. The reality of the geopolitical ups and downs also warrants revisiting some of the major policy prescriptions that grew out of this rising powers literature. What's that? I know, I, read, I have slides, I have notes in my thing. That's okay. And so the, um, so Brian's used to the way, thing. see, I, I threw him off, okay? Because I, I actually sent him the title last night, and he was like, is it Sunday morning? Did I sleep oversleep or something? <laughs> and uh, he, was, he thought the rapture might have happened or something. And, um, but, it's interesting that, that what everybody was so certain about in world geopolitics just 10 years ago, even five or six years ago, has completely been upended. Now, let me suggest this, and I don't want to sound sacrilegious when I say this, but I look at what's going on in the world, and I've made this suggestion to some of my friends in some messages we've exchanged back and forth. Maybe the Almighty's just messing with us a little bit. You know, like, we think we have it all figured out. We've got all our little charts and graphs and maps and all that. And, you know, maybe God's just saying, but you didn't see that one coming, did you? And I think God does have kind of a sense of humor about these things. And what we really need to take away from all that is, he's the one who's in control. And all, all of these bright, intelligent, elite people who think they know everything and they know exactly what to do, you know what, I know there are evil people that want to control everything, but you know what, they're human just like us. They're not gods. They're in the grip of the evil one, no doubt about that. But they're not gods. And all of this stuff, the final chapter will unfold when God, the real true God, says it's time. Okay, then he will pull back and he will let... Satan have his final shot. And the end of that will be Satan will be chained, the Antichrist and false prophet cast alive into a lake of fire, and you'll be here to witness all of that. So just keep that in mind that 
you know, sometimes we need to be a little bit humble about how we approach our analysis of these things. And I've probably become personally less dogmatic about how all of these things unfold. I think there are some alternate scenarios that are that you can make the case for biblically. So, and that's why sometimes I don't talk a lot about who is the final beast empire, because I think I think it's still a bit of an open question. Now, I know a lot of people will disagree with me, and that's fine. Uh, I'm still be a happy guy. The one thing the two sides agreed on, she says in this article, was that the shifts wrought by rising powers would be tectonic. In mapping the global future, an influential analysis published by the U.S. National Intelligence Council in 2004, intelligence experts predicted that the Arivista powers, like China, India, and perhaps others such as Brazil and Indonesia, have the potential to render obsolete the old categories of East and West, North and South. And listen, the, the point of her article is, whatever we thought, we need to maybe relook, reanalyze, look at history, look at the history of just the last 10 years as to what's happened in the world, and, and they want to, listen, Everybody wants to know what's going to happen in the future. Atheistic, secular, humanist people want to know what's going to happen. The advantage we have as Christians is we do have a roadmap that gives us some pretty definite markers to indicate what's going to happen. And that's why we spend a lot of time on it here at Fellowship Bible Chapel, because we think what the Scripture says is important. So let's look at some other things that are going on. This is important, Russia. Now, there are a lot of people today, as I read, I read, believe me, I read a lot of things. I listen to a lot of things. And I'm seeing more and more people that sound like they are a, um, a church arm of Pravda. And they're spouting Russia propaganda. Because I've heard over time, Oh, Russia's so open, they're so Christian. Putin's the great Christian leader of the world. Listen, folks, that's baloney, okay? Can I just say that? People are being duped, and it's happening in the Christian community. And I hear, I hear it all, Pam can tell you, she's always like, oh, who are you listening to now? I can see you starting to get all riled up over there. And I do because I'm concerned about it. And now here's example, a, exhibit A, as to why Putin can't be trusted. They've now locked down evangelism. Religious freedom or whatever they had in Russia is gone. Jewish groups are complaining about it. No evangelism outside of the Russian Orthodox Church. You have to register. You have to get, I mean, it's police state stuff. It's old Soviet Union stuff. It hasn't changed. It's not going to change until Jesus returns. Absent the direct, miraculous, divine intervention of God Almighty himself. But looking at it from a human standpoint, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. So if God intervenes, I'm all, I'll be on board with it 100%. An article in the New York Times this morning, is the Islamic State unstoppable? He goes through and everybody says, oh, we've got him on the run and all this other stuff. And the headline captures a good quote from the article. More people blowing themselves up is not a sign of a dying group. And just in the last week, in, in the fog of everything that's been going on here in the U.S., there were hundreds and hundreds of people killed by suicide bombers in Iraq, in uh, Bangladesh, um, there was an attack in downtown Baghdad that killed almost 300 people. There was an attack on a Shia, Shiite uh, holy place the other day, a suicide bomber. And I fear, you just need to get used to it, that it's, I believe this is on the increase. And I'm getting to where I might tell you why I think some of this is going on. But you can wait. Here in our own country, I talked about <laughs> this, uh, not yet, Keep them wanting more. 
this, art, this is the Hellerstadt decision, a 5-3 uh, decision of the Supreme Court striking down all the abortion laws in Texas. Any, any restriction on abortion has effectively been struck down. I talked a little bit about this last Sunday. A uh, decision came down a week ago, Monday, uh, at the end of the Supreme Court term. It's an incredibly important decision. You should get it. Take um, a sedative and read the majority opinion, uh, and then the fact that you've been sedated a little bit, you will be energized by reading the dissents, because the dissents are really, I think, the most important part, because they were written by people who actually understand that we have a constitution and a dissent by Justice Thomas, which may be one of his last, folks. The word is he will resign this fall, regardless of who's elected. You know, he's been at it for, what is it, 25 years at least now. And, um, and he's just, he's ready to retire. I won't, I won't see, the, by the way, you see the Supreme Court, this is a, uh, courtroom artist drawing of the argument in Hellerstedt, and you see the chair there with the black draped over it because of the death of Justice Scalia. Here's some things that he said, and I want you to listen to this because, you know, I, I do like the United States Constitution. I think it's a great governing document. Not perfect, but it has some good principles because of mainly freedom and liberty at the heart of it that are being destroyed by people like Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and their ilk. And I apologize for slandering ilk. <laughs> the majority's furtive reconfiguration of the standard, and, and so what happens is that they, they, there's these standards that have developed in the Supreme Court. There's uh, strict scrutiny, there's middle level of strict scrutiny, there's the rational basis test, and so they come up with all these different tests, and they say, okay, in this type of case, we're going to apply this test. Now, that's a moving thing, because they'll, what they'll do is they'll apply whatever test gets them to the result that they want, which means that there's really no test at all. And that's what Justice Thomas says. Listen to this. The majority's furtive reconfiguration of the standard also points to a deeper problem. The undue burden standard is just one variant of the court's tiers of scrutiny approach to constitutional adjudication. And the label the court affixes to its level of scrutiny in assessing whether the government can restrict a given right, be it rational basis, intermediate, strict, or something else, is increasingly a meaningless formalism. What, what's, what's that mean? It means they do whatever they want to do. They don't care what the law is. They care about the result. And this is true. Listen, I went to law school um, a few years ago. And... This was going on, this was clear. I mean, uh, the ink was still pretty fresh on the Roe versus Wade decision when I started law school. It was one of the, the main things. We talked about it for weeks in constitutional law, my first year in law school. And if you had any appreciation for the Constitution, you could see that if this didn't change, we were going to have a big problem and it didn't change, and we have a big problem. As the court applies whatever standard it likes to any given case, Justice Thomas says, nothing but empty words separates our constitutional decisions from judicial fiat. The court has simultaneously transformed judicially created rights, like the right to abortion, into preferred constitutional rights, while disfavoring many of the rights actually enumerated in the Constitution. It sounds like he's listening to Hillary Clinton because she says there's reasonable restrictions you can put on the right to bear arms. So my question is, okay, Hillary, you think constitutional rights have a reasonable restriction and they're subject to reasonable restriction? What do you think is a reasonable restriction on abortion? And you know what she will say. Nothing. Kill 2,000 black babies a day. She doesn't care. But our Constitution renounces the notion that some constitutional rights are more equal than others. A plaintiff either possesses the constitutional right he is asserting or not, 
And if not, the judiciary has no business creating ad hoc exceptions so that others can assert rights that seem especially important to vindicate. A law either infringes a constitutional right or not. There is no room for the judiciary to invent tolerable degrees of encroachment. Unless the court abides by one set of rules to adjudicate constitutional rights, it will continue reducing constitutional law to policy-driven value judgments until the last shreds of its legitimacy disappear. Today's decision will prompt some to claim victory, just as it will, it will stiffen opponents' will to object. But the entire nation has lost something essential. I, I, mean, I think I'll cry when he resigns. Do you know the courage it takes for that man to say this and to hold this in this culture and in that environment that he lives in and works in every day? The majority's embrace of a jurisprudence of rights-specific exceptions and balancing tests is, and he's quoting here, I believe, Justice Scalia in an article that he wrote, Justice Scalia wrote, a regrettable concession of defeat, an acknowledgment that we have passed the point where law, properly speaking, has any further application. Boy, that's great. By the way, I should have put the slide at the front, so I'll just cover it right here. There's a uh, gathering this week, Together 2016 in Washington, D.C. It'll be this, a bunch of evangelicals and ecumenical stuff. It's supposed to happen on J uh, July 16th, so pay attention to what's going on. I think it's next Saturday. They want a million people on the mall in Washington. The Pope's going to give a, a thing. And I only say this is, um, I think Jackie Alnor uh, put this up. You see this, Kansas City 2017? Unitedinchrist.com. This is yet another ecumenical thing that's coming up. And if you remember, I did a video a couple years ago called Stream of Ecumen Streams of Ecumenism with Tim Wirth. And I talked about what, at least information that I had been made privy to about what was coming. And now, look at, this is, this is their website. So what are they going to celebrate in 2017? This is exactly what I said, at least a couple of them the 50th anniversary of the Charismatic Catholic Renewal, the 50th anniversary of Jerusalem becoming united under Israeli administration. I said that two years ago. Oh, and not because I thought it up, I'd heard that they were, the Pope was talking about it with evangelical leader named Tony Palmer. Now, dead leader Tony Palmer. The 40th anniversary of Kansas City won a stadium event and what? The 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. They're going to play off this, folks. Just understand that it's coming. So let me go back. That was sort of the, the little vignette. So we could catch our breath on the decline of American jurisprudence. But this is an example of yet more decline. Here is a complaint filed by Alliance Defending Freedom, I believe, in Iowa on behalf of a church over transgender bathroom policies. Now, listen, didn't they tell us that this won't affect the church, right? We're going to, they're liars. They are abject, complete, total frauds and liars. And not only in Iowa, here's a brochure that the Iowa human, this is Iowa. I have friends, Bill Randalls is a friend of mine. He's a pastor, by the way. Pastor in Iowa, in the Cedar Rapids area, Marion. Listen, Bill Randalls has a blog. He has a blog post up today. I think it's really williamrandalls.blogspot.com or something like that. Um, Karen, I think you posted it on your Facebook page the other day. Um, it, the Sifting of America, it's called. So just look up Bill Randalls, William Randalls, Sifting of America, and find it. Um, We'll try to link it in the, uh, the notes that we put up with the YouTube video today. He, he nails it on every count in that it's incredibly wise. In fact, I, probably the best thing I could have done today maybe is just got up here and read, read what Bill Randalls wrote. But he lives in Iowa. It's a great church. I've been there. I've spoken in that pulpit. And they're under attack. 
the churches in Iowa, the faithful evangelical churches, are under attack. Because the Iowa Human Rights Commission, look at what they said in this brochure. Sexual orientation and gender identity. Well, that, you know, they, they, it's, we have religious freedom, right? That's in the First Amendment to the Constitution. So that applies everywhere, so we shouldn't have to worry about it. But look at what they say. Does the law prohibit sex-segregated locker rooms and living facilities? No. Iowa does permit, permit it. And it says this, the new law does require, however, that individuals are permitted to access those facilities in accordance with their gender identity rather than their assigned sex at birth without being harassed or questioned. Folks, this is, this is fantasy world. This is what happens when people under the God, judgment of God, they think like this. And they're going to go into court and they're going to defend this nonsense. Man, I am. It's getting hot. Does this law apply to churches? Why would they put that in the brochure? Sometimes. The Iowa law provides these protections do not apply to religious institutions with respect to any religion based qualifications when such qualifications are related to bona fide religious purpose. Where qualifications are not related to a bona fide religious purpose, Churches are still subject to the law's provisions. Child care facility operated at a church or a church service open to the public. Listen, let me tell you this. I know Bill Randalls will say this. Everything that this church does, Fellowship Bible Chapel, everything that Believers in Grace does in Cedar Rapids, or Marion, Iowa, everything we do has a religious purpose. We do not do one single thing around here that is not a religious person, and as long as we live in a country where we have a First Amendment to the Constitution, we are going to demand our right to freedom of religion. And what they want to do is they want to limit it to, they want to limit it to freedom of worship. And they are twisting the words and language around in an Orwellian fashion to achieve the result that they want, exactly like Justice Thomas predicted. And it is a travesty of justice. So, okay, now i got to go quickly. Right, let's look at the Middle East and Israel for a minute because there's some things there that I want you to look at. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu went to Kenya this week. Let us rededicate ourselves to the spirit of Entebbe. You know, I posted some things about the... Uh, the uh, story of Yoni Netanyahu, you go look at that. Here's Caroline Glick's article. I talked a little bit about this last week, Israel's diplomatic spring. A lot of countries are coming to Israel now because they're realizing that Israel's a little bit more stable than just about any place else over there. <laughs> and they're realizing that. And so Israel's getting a lot of support from Africa. And the interesting thing, other than northern Africa, I don't see the other countries in the other parts of Africa discussed in Bible prophecy. Is that because they're aligned with Israel? I don't know. I, it's very possible. It just seems to me that the world's lining up exactly like the Bible said that it would. Um, on the board, uh, this is kind of interesting, a Russian helicopter got shot down in Syria by ISIS the other day. A couple of Russians killed. We'll see how um, Putin responds to that. Here's some reports of suicide units uh, from Iran. Hezbollah amassing on the Golan border in Israel. That's pretty significant. Amir Sarfati posted this on his blog just either yesterday or today. Syrian conflict is about to wipe the country off the map. There are actually Bible prophecies about that happening. In Isaiah 17, Damascus will cease from being a city. Gatestone Institute has this, the Arabs' historic mistakes and their interactions with Israel how they could have accepted partition in 1947. And the analyst, uh, uh, the writer of this article, um, says, listen, and I, I believe he's Arab, he says, we, we blew it. <laughs> we had a chance at a Palestinian state in 1947, and we went to war with Israel. And about time we understand that when you go to war with somebody, there are actually things called consequences to doing that, especially if you lose. And they still have not gotten it. And this is going to come up from a vote again. UNESCO to vote on Jewish connection with the Temple Mount. Jordan, everybody says Jordan is moderate Jordan, right? They're wonderful. 
they, they are saying, they are sponsoring this with the Palestinians, who, by the way, they have not integrated into their country. A few they did. But throughout the Arab world, there are millions of Palestinians in refugee camps where the conditions are deplorable. You can go look at the pictures of one in Damascus. Before it was bombed, the smithereens, it was awful. About a million people living in a little bit over a square mile. It's, I mean, you can see the pictures of it. It's, it's unbelievable. And that's in wonderful Syria that people talk about, oh, the great leader Assad. Caroline Glick's article this week. I'm almost to my point. Moral equivalence has become a moral atrocity. And she was very happy this morning that Trump's Israel advisor had come out with a paper questioning the wisdom of the two-state solution. But listen to what she says in her column from Tuesday's Jerusalem Post. We have reached the point where moral equivalence has become a moral atrocity. The smart set in the West has insisted for over a generation that Israel and the Palestinians are morally equal. There are extremists on both sides, they say. Both sides are responsible for the absence of peace. The first serious outcry against this lie came immediately after the Palestinians began their terrorist war against Israel in September 2000. What happened? Well, Ehud Barak said, we're going to give 95% of the land to them. Caroline continues, the areas in question, Barak said, would be handed over to the PLO Jew-free. Let me ask you this. In any other conflict on the earth, this is from a Jewish leader who did this. But that is the Palestinian demand. The hundreds of thousands of Jews living in the areas set to become Palestine would be forcefully evicted from their homes to ensure that the delicate, sensitive Palestinians wouldn't be troubled by the Jews with their dirty feet and the words of Abbas. The smart set's failure to note reality back in September 2000 marked the beginning of its descent into moral oblivion. Its first step down that road was when its members coined the pernicious term cycle of violence. Here, here's the point. You divide Israel and you are in big, big trouble. You will decline, your society will collapse into chaos, but that wouldn't happen to us here in the United States, would it? Well, let's read on. The latest consequences of this moral depravity came on Friday when the publication, and I've mentioned this briefly last Sunday, the so-called Middle East Quartet's much-awaited report that is supposed to show us the way to peace. That report, like its predecessors insisted that a Jewish settler is the moral equivalence of a Palestinian murderer. Who would have been one of the participants in that quartet? The United States of America. Hmm. Look at what's going on. The quartet recommends that both sides de-escalate tensions. But of course, only the Palestinians are escalating tensions. Both sides, the wise men tell us, should take all necessary steps to prevent violence and protect the lives and properties of all civilians. But only one side is fomenting violence and deliberately targeting civilians. The report includes an empty call for the Palestinians to act decisively and take all steps within its capacity to cease incitement to violence and strengthen ongoing efforts to combat terrorism, including by clearly condoning all acts of terrorism. The Palestinians, of course, will do no such thing. After pretending that the people who transform Palestinian society into the hate-filled murder-applauding mob, it has become, are interested in doing the opposite. The quartet turned its guns on Israel. Israel, the court says, needs to deny Jewish property rights. Israel needs to expand the powers of the Palestinian death cult into Area C, where all the Israeli communities are located in but 2% of the Palestinians live. So where 2% of them live, we're going to make that Jew free. Because that's acceptable in the world that we live in. That's acceptable to the government of the United States of America. Halal Yaffa Ariel. I played the clip of her mother's eulogy at her funeral in Hebron last week. That funeral took place in the ancient center of Hebron, a place where People where the UNESCO, who denies any connection, Jewish connection to the Temple Mount, also denies any tomb connection, Jewish connection to the tomb of people named Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's insanity, folks. 
you mess around with Israel. And listen, I'm not an apologist for everything that goes on in Israel. Do you understand that? They need the Lord. Record numbers of them are turning to the Lord. There is a great promise of a national salvation at some point in time, but there will be terrible times in between. We have to be honest about that. And I pray in God's mercy that might not happen, but that may be the only way for God to be glorified. So whatever God wants, that's what we'll go along with. And so here in this area where you can sit there at the funeral and look at the vineyards around Hebron, Caroline says this to conclude her article, surrounded by the vines and the hills, the, the Ariel's homestead looks like the sort of place where nothing bad can happen. A quiet family of profound faith, the Ariels were just going about their quiet lives, raising their daughters, tending to their, their vines, when the evil beyond their gate entered their home and struck. That is the difference between the two sides. One wishes to tend his vineyard, the other wishes to destroy it. It is black and white. It is a clear distinction. The international community's pernicious refusal to recognize this basic fact after so many years is a major reason that there is no peace and there is so much bloodshed. And I would submit to you, it is behind the chaos we see in the West today. And if you don't like that, go listen to somebody else that will fill your head with a bunch of nonsense about Zionist conspiracies, okay? You won't get that here, I assure you. And so let's, what happened in the United States? Ramirez cartoon, Lady Justice, we could not prove intent. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this just in the interest of mercy. But I want you to remember the person at the center of this believes this. To exist in practice, not just on paper. Laws have to be backed up with resources and political will. And deep-seated cultural codes, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed. As I... So listen, I don't want to listen to that person moralizing to me for the next four to eight years. So you decide who you're going to vote for. I've made my decision. My conscience will be clear before God. You decide based on your conscience, okay? I think it's something we have liberty in. Because I know, I know what will happen if she's elected. And it will be things like this. So we had um, the events of the week. We had um, Hillary gets an FBI interview on the Saturday of July 4th weekend. Now, folks, I've been around FBI interviews. I know them, okay? I'm telling you, I don't know of anyone else who ever got a Saturday on a holiday weekend FBI interview. And the morning... Right first thing the morning after the 4th of July, Comey comes out and says, no prosecution, no indictment. Then the New York Times the next morning has this little leak. Just happened to make it into the, whether you like it or not, most important newspaper in the United States of America. Democrats close to Mrs. Clinton say that she may decide to retain Ms. Lynch, the nation's first black woman to be attorney general who took office in April 2015. This coming on the heels of the private accidental meeting of Hillary, of, of Loretta Lynch and Bill Clinton on a tarmac on their private jets in Phoenix. Now, I'm not, I'm not big on conspiracy theories, okay? This one is so airtight. So, uh, and then Lynch came out the next day after the New York Times article. Now she's got her job offer, right? So she comes out and says, no prosecution, we're closing the file. And again, stern, and then, of course, immediately, she's on Air Force One with Obama going to a campaign stop in North Carolina. It was just, what was it, two hours? Just so happened that they were able to put all that together over a holiday weekend. I was born at night. But as they say, it wasn't last night. <laughs> Even the people at MSNBC, and by the way, I am not going to be done at noon. I apologize to my wife. I will be done shortly, a little bit after. 
and honey, I will, I will take you out to ice cream place, three ice cream places this afternoon if you want. I will sacrifice my time this afternoon to do that. That's the kind of guy I am, okay? I'm thinking about how to, I'm thinking about getting her a new driver for Christmas. Now, if you're a golfer, you know what that is, so. Even the people at MSNBC can't stomach this. Listen to this. Okay, so after the, when you talk about the video we saw, after that litany of violations that James Comey outlined, some might have expected a different outcome, maybe a recommendation of charges, but there was none, which would seem to cap this investigation, which many feel has had appearances of impropriety from the start. Let's go back to President Obama speaking out on the case, which... Now listen, she is... Uh... At best, she's center-left, okay, in her political orientation. By the way, I understand she and Scarborough are having a personal relationship. She just recently got divorced. But uh, I'm, I'm going to give them props for saying this. So she goes through, she's going to play this. Strange in itself. Bizarre. A long time ago, in April. Take a look. Do you think it posed a national security problem? I don't think it posed a national security problem. I think that it, uh, it was a mistake that she's acknowledged. Do you agree with what President Clinton has said and, and Secretary Clinton has said that this is not uh, not that big a deal? Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, I'm not going to comment uh, uh, on... Do you think it's that big a deal? Uh, what, what I think is that it is important for her to answer these questions to the satisfaction of the american public and they can make their own judgment uh, i can tell you that this is not a situation in which america's national security was endangered standing secretary of state she would never intentionally put uh, america in any kind of jeopardy and what i also know because i handle a lot of classified information uh, is that there are there's classified and then there's classified. So that was October and, and then April. And by the way, the FBI agents on this case were just absolutely outraged that the President of the United States tried to bigfoot the investigation all the way back in October. It was so inappropriate. So flash forward to eight days ago when President Bill Clinton had a private meeting with Attorney General Loretta Lynch on a tarmac in Phoenix. He made a point of getting on her plane to talk to her. Lynch says they discussed personal issues like golf and grandkids unrelated to the investigation of Secretary Clinton. Only it was followed up days later in the New York Times, which reported that the Clintons appeared to dangle a job in front of the Attorney General. Quote, Democrats close to, close to Mrs. Clinton say she may decide to retain Miss Lynch, who took office in April of 2015. John Heilman. I, I... By the way... I, written in the New York Times without comment that the Clintons are dangling a job offer in front of a woman that has the power to indict her and end her presidential campaign. I have to say that I, you know, the thought that the thing that Bill Clinton did with Loretta Lynch was ridiculous and right. brought all kinds of political problems on his wife, and you kind of want to write it off. It just not not write it off in the sense that it's not bad, but write it to oh, Bill Clinton, you can't control Bill Clinton. Right. This thing in the New York Times coming directly after that, in what appears to be a core way that you know that they decided to leak through cutouts to the New York Times the notion that Lynch might be retained in the administration it just makes the whole thing um, stink wait a minute and it makes the whole thing stink and it just provides again such fodder to Trump's arguments about this is just a rigged system it's a corrupt elite a corrupt establishment another this whole thing is just rotten to the core okay it's just so self it's just so uh, self D d lacerating yeah. that they that they engaged in this behavior so and the run up to when they knew it all for like five days yes you got the meeting with bill clinton loretta lynch you have the new york times article dangling the job you have the secret meeting with the fbi tucked away in a july 4th meeting on a saturday morning well, well, i don't i don't think the, i don't think the clinton campaign was, it just was, happened to it, be on a Saturday morning, July 4th weekend. Oh, I, it just happened to be. I, I think and then, as the news breaks that there's no charges, yes. there's no charges, but the president is live at 5 p.m. in North Carolina with Hillary Clinton flying down on Air Force to One step on to step on the news, news cycle. Wait, 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 are you kidding me? Are, I'm sorry. Are we this stupid? We're not right. stupid. Absolutely. Let's right. Let's Maybe the American... So, props to Mika Brzezinski this time, okay?
Good job, Mika. Yes, they do think you're that stupid. They do. Trey Gowdy showed that we're not. Good morning, Director Comey. Uh, Secretary Clinton said she never sent or received any classified information over her private email. Was that true? Our investigation found that there was classified information sent. So it was not true? It, right. That's what I said. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm looking for a little shorter answer, so you and I are not here quite as long. Secretary Clinton said there was nothing marked classified on her emails either sent or received. Was that true? That's not true. There were a small number of portion markings on, I think, three of the documents. Secretary three Clinton three said, I did not email any classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material. Was that true? No, there was classified material emailed. Secretary Clinton said she used just one device. Was that true? She used multiple devices during the four years uh, of her term as Secretary of State. Secretary Clinton said all work-related emails were returned to the State Department. Was that true? No, we found work-related emails, thousands, that were not returned. Secretary Clinton said neither she nor anyone else deleted work-related emails from her personal account. Was that true? That's a harder one to answer. Uh, we found traces of work-related emails uh, in, on devices or in Slack space, whether they were deleted or whether when a server was changed out, something happened to them. There's no doubt that there were work-related emails that were removed electronically from the the email system. Just, and then he goes on, go, go to C-SPAN, watch the whole exchange. It's a, here, here's what I want to say. One thing is, she's lying. She's a big liar. She's committed perjury. And the, there is no requirement of intent in the law. In fact, Mika Brzezinski goes into the fact that Comey's FBI prosecuted a guy who just emailed himself a document and he was had to resign from the uh, the services the armed services and agree that he would never ever seek a security clearance again that's why Paul Ryan came out and said let's apply that standard to Hillary Clinton deny her access to, to briefings as she's going through this presidential campaign because you can't trust her it should be obvious okay that's comment number one Number two, Trey Gowdy for Attorney General. <laughs> Even Maureen Dowd of the New York Times this morning says this, the Clinton contamination. It says a lot about our relationship with Hillary Clinton, that she seems well on her way to becoming Madam, Madam President because she's not getting indicted. It's, um, it's insane. But then this. Now, the investigation's not done on what happened in Minnesota. The left-wing governor up there, though, he came out and he could pronounce that race played a role in this shooting. And listen, yeah, I'm, you know me, I'm all for electronic stuff and everything. But what kind of person, when your boyfriend is laying dead bleeding in front of you, live streams it on the Facebook. I don't understand this. This is a picture, too, that was circulated among the police department up there about a suspect that looks suspiciously like the man who was killed doing an armed robbery a couple days before. And the report is that that's why the cop pulled him over was because he looked like that guy. Okay? By the way, word this morning is he's been arrested 52 times. Now, I, when I was in high school, our high school, we always had a, we had a very famous musical, and I played in the orchestra. It was called Guys and Dolls. And one of the lines in Guys and Dolls is, the, one of the, the gamblers that's involved says, I have a perfect record, 47 arrests and no convictions. Now that would make you a hero. This has been fomented by Barack Hussein Obama. His comments about police, his comments about Ferguson, his comments about Trayvon Martin, on and on and on. Every time the facts show him totally wrong. Even his own Justice Department 
wouldn't indict anybody in the Ferguson matter. By the way, if you're listening to this, you don't like this, don't write comments on YouTube because you're going to be deleted and blocked immediately, okay? I know you don't like it, but I'm telling you the truth. You need to go look up on Prager University, Heather McDonald. Go get her book. She's written a great book about it, uh, about how this is affecting, this, this attitude is affecting policing in the United States. They don't want to do anything. Even the secular people, this is New York Daily Post, New York Daily News, it's civil war, it's madness. All the headlines on Friday talking about ambush, five officers killed, four in Dallas. But the next morning, the next morning, when this news of the slaughter, the, from what I understand, the largest killing on a single day assassination of police officers in the history of the United States, where they intentionally went out to kill police. Any pictures of it on the front page of the New York Times? They don't have screen capture devices at the New York Times to get the pictures off of, of, of the newscast on CNN or Fox or whatever? They weren't able to get that and put it into the paper by the next morning? Oh, but they have all the pictures of the video that this gal live-streamed of the shooting in Minnesota. They're fomenting this, too. Remind you, a year ago, somebody posted this of a video they took. At, you need to listen closely. This is a video of a Black Lives Matter protest in New York City. Okay, take the sound button. You hear what they're saying? What do we want? Dead cops. When do we want it? Now. Don't tell me that this Black Lives Matters is a good organization. I'm sorry. And hundreds have been killed in Chicago alone in that community. Any protests about that? A little boy was shot and paralyzed up in Cleveland recently. Anybody out there protesting about that in a drive-by shooting? This is what happens when a nation abandons God. I will submit that this is what happens when a nation messes around with Israel. I think there's a direct relationship. The report comes out on Friday, and the quartet report that Caroline Glick wrote about, and what happens? All hell breaks loose. So, um, apparently he's part of the New Black Panthers. Um, this hate group called for killing white cops. Then Dallas sniper Micah Xavier Johnson started shooting. They've said this. This was on a Facebook post of the African American Defense League. It had 170 likes, one of which was Micah Xavier Johnson. Now, a lot of this has been removed from Facebook, but thank the Lord for ability to capture this stuff before people take it down so we can find out the truth of what they're really about so they can't fake us out. We have no alternative. We must kill white police officers across the country. We are calling on the gangs across the nation. Attack everything in blue except the mailman unless he is carrying more than mail. Micah Johnson was just one of 170 members who follow this Facebook. Even the UN is now weighed in. UN condemns this weekly deadly gun violence in the United States. Look at this. The working group of experts on people of African descent is outraged and strongly condemns the new police killings of two African-American men, the group's chairman, Ricardo A. Sunga III, said in a statement today, in which he also noted that the incidents demonstrate a high level of structural and institutional racism. The Daily News, America in tatters. See pages 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 20, 30, and 31. They call me the negative guy. And so from this parking garage, the red building there in the foreground, five Dallas police officers were killed in 
Dallas. The Hill, American anger boils over. National Review, if we don't all take a deep breath, our address will only get worse. From either the Washington Post or the New York Times, three summer days further split nation already in deep turmoil. So listen, don't tell me that I'm up here week after week making this stuff up, okay? I'm glad everybody's joining us. This is from a Black Lives member. Thank you, Micah, exclamation point, from her Twitter account. Uh, certain presidential candidates said this, white Americans need to do a better job of listening when African Americans talk about the seen and unseen barriers you face every day. Oh, here, play this, uh, let me back up, play this clip. This is Sheriff Clark from uh, Milwaukee. Rhetoric I don't think is going to go away, but we need to delegitimize this Black Lives Matter movement. We've had enough of their nonsense. Okay. That was a much longer clip, but I think I got the essence of where he stands. <laughs> Sally Cohn, who is a LGBT activist, left-wing nutcase, tried to say, well, calling abortion a clinic baby killers is rhetoric that incites violence whereas Black Lives Matter's message literally opposes violence. <laughs> Folks, this is not to be trivialized with. When you shake your fingers at God's principles, he will, Romans 1 says, give you over to a reprobate mind. I pray she gets saved, okay? I don't want her to not be. But I cannot s s be quiet in the face of some as such abject evil and the idiocy that comes out of it. And we need to speak up and tell the truth about this. This is evil. And um, We've got a problem. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you say, that's the only, 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 only hope for the world. Let's pray. Father, give us the strength to stand in evil days. Give us the courage to speak the truth and share the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.